Last week, we looked at the phenomenal growth of viticulture in India. This week, we continue our wine series with a taste of the top end of the wine market in Europe. Despite worries in some parts of Europe about declining consumption, the international appetite for wine is still growing. More than 30 billion bottles of grape-based wines were consumed in 2004, and that's projected to increase to more than 32 billion by 2008. But it's not just about drinking more. Consumers are becoming more discerning about what they put in their glasses and their cellars, with both their taste buds and their bank balances in mind. With thousands of wines from all over the world on the market, Western consumers can face a daunting array of choices. But these days, more people are approaching those choices with a thirst for knowledge. Certainly people, um, I've noticed, are becoming a lot more savvy uh, with the wine selection. They're wanting to learn a lot more about what's in the bottle, what they're drinking, some of the story and the history behind it. What do you smell? The smell is intriguing, isn't it? The increased knowledge is boosted by wine courses like this one. The Wine Education Service in London teaches around 600 students a term. Enrollment is up 400% over the last eight years as fine wine moves away from a world of wealthy older men towards a new generation of wine connoisseurs. I'm much more interested in just tasting different wines, jotting down some notes and deciding, right, that's one I'm going to get next time, rather than I try and become a, a super expert on how to do wine tasting. Leave that to the professionals like Paul Milroy, the Bordeaux buyer for Berry Brothers and Rudd in London. He spends $27 million a year on wine and in buying sprees has to taste up to 700 wines a week. And that occasionally includes very fine wines like this. Chateau uh, Aubryon. Uh, okay. uh, a bottle of, let's have a look, a uh, bottle of 76 Chateau Aubryon, which should be quite splendid actually. Filling your wine cellar with wines like these is only for those with deep pockets. One customer has racked up $10 million worth of purchases here. We've got a few lovely bottles that we keep down in our cellar here. Um, for example, this would be a bottle of Petrus 2000, which is very much highly sought after. The production is very small. This is probably seen as one of the best wines from Bordeaux. Um, and you'd be looking now at $17,000 a case. But back when it was first sold, it was just $5,000 because wine improves with age and stocks of good vintages decline as they're consumed, wine makes an attractive investment. But those who invest aren't necessarily aficionados. They buy and sell uh, the, the wine as they would do stocks and shares. They have no interest in drinking it, in tasting it or whatever. By storing wine in a bonded warehouse like this one in East London, owners avoid paying sales tax. And as a wasting asset, wine is not subject to capital gains tax in the UK. If you're patient, you can make up to 500% profit on your purchases. If you can afford to, hold on to the wine until it's well within its plateau of maturity. Um, that can be sometimes anything from 15 to, to 20 years after the vintage. Um, and at that time, you'll find that there's very little supply of that wine around, but it's tasting fantastic and the critics are writing spectacular things about it. And the demand for it will be at its highest. Hi, can I get a glass of Merlot, please? This glass isn't the most expensive wine Julianne Amos has ever bought. As a wine investor, she holds 12 to 15 cases of wine, each valued between $3,000 and $5,500. Not that she cares much about what she owns. I don't even know what wine I own, let alone go and look at the boxes. Um, it's, it's somewhere. I don't know where it is. I've got lots of paperwork, so presumably that tells me where it is. These days, top wines from the best vintages continue to outperform the stock market. What I've found is that wine has been probably the most stable investment vehicle that I've used. Everything from sort of day-to-day, short-term betting through to stock investing um, has been more volatile than the wine market. But for others, the pleasure of wine remains in the drinking. John Walker had his spiral cellar installed in February. Inevitably, I've, the, the stuff that I'm going to drink uh, first, I've stored near the top um, because it's uh, most accessible. Um, and uh, the, the stuff that I'm going to keep for a few years is nearer the bottom, further away from temptation. John filled his cellar with over a thousand bottles in a 48-hour booze cruise to France a popular option for British buyers wanting to avoid higher UK sales taxes. 
1900s offered at 1900s. Another That's option might have been to buy at auction. Then, Christie's sells 60 million dollars worth of wine a year. 2000. 2000. Prices in our sales normally range widely from at the low end, something in the region of 15 or 20 dollars, uh, right up to uh, 30, 40 thousand dollars a case. Proving that in the world of wine, there's something for all budgets and all palates, whether or not you wish to drink your profits. Cheers. Cheers. And the most expensive wine ever sold by the auction house Christie's was a bottle of 17th century Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, once owned by Thomas Jefferson. It went for $200,000.